Hey, I'm Dr. Ruth Roberts, the creator of the original Crock Pet Diet, and uh, welcome to Facebook Live today. It is uh, just a few days before the eclipse. I live here in uh, South Carolina, which is, uh, I think that's supposed to be like the the last spot of totality in the run of the eclipse over uh, over the United States and so folks are gearing up for an onslaught of something like a million vi vi visitors which is kinda crazy so that's all kinda weird stuff out there but um, if you do live in the path of the eclipse the reason I mention this is that it changes things electromagnetically and light the light changes and that sort of stuff. So there is some concern that pets may be a little bit kind of hmm, nervous and anxious because they don't they don't understand what's going on. So if you've got a dog that is anxious in general, you may consider using uh, something that's a little bit calming, like liquid Nutricalm, so a tryptophan, theanine type product, adaptal spray, Benadryl, something like that, just so that uh, you know they they don't get too freaked out about all this stuff. So that's what I know about the eclipse. I'm actually going to be in Oregon on the other other side of the coast uh, during the eclipse and we're looking forward to getting into nice cool weather too. So glad to see Sally here. Um, thanks guys for coming and hanging out with me every week. Thanks for sharing the videos. That helps us get the word out. Um, I had a, a question from a friend and a foreign client, a for, former client about um, lymphangiectasia. Her dog has been diagnosed with that recently, and uh, it's it's not a fun disease. So if you look it up, and I'm going to read the definition for you because um, I think this this will get a couple of points across to you, which I'll discuss in a moment. But lymphangiectasia is an obstructive lymphatic disorder that results in losses loss of lymphatic contents into the intestinal lumen and it's one of the most common causes of protein losing enteropathy in dogs and it can be primary or secondary to other disorders such as cancer right-sided heart failure inflammatory bowel disease or uh, liver hypertension portal hypertension and it is uh, there is an increased prevalence in Yorkshire Terriers soft-coated Wheaton Terriers Norwegian Lundehunds and Basenji um, so that tells you sort of what it does, but what it doesn't say is what causes it. And so that's the million dollar question. Sometimes it's associated with another disease like cancer. You could see that being a problem if there were uh, some sort of a diffuse cancer in the, in the intestines that was obstructing the lymphatic flow. But then there's another disease similar in cats called thoracic duct rupture. Um, and that can cause this lymphatic effusion into the chest, which you can imagine is absolutely miserable. You know, you're trying to breathe and you've got all this liquid and not just water uh, weight, but, you know, lymph is composed of fat and cells, uh, you know, taking up space in your chest. And that's got to be pretty miserable. So both of, in both of these diseases, the treatments are always immunosuppressive drugs and then a low-fat diet. So let's dive in a little bit deeper and see if we can get to kind of the root issue. So my friend's dog is, um, I think she's three or four, and uh, she's a little Maltese thing, so she doesn't fit, fit the um, predisposed breed category. She doesn't have any other health conditions. Nothing weird happened before this. She hadn't been having any symptoms of diarrhea, things of that nature. So the and, and it, the thing that um, is is interesting is that when I was in veterinary school, I actually wrote a paper on a little Boston Terrier that had lymphangiectasia, and so this is now this is in 1990, so this is 27 years ago, um, and same deal. You know, we didn't really understand what caused it, but at least. At least folks said we didn't we don't know what causes it but it seems to be some sort of a quasi autoimmune disease does that sound familiar um, and so you know that again the treatment conventionally is going to be immunosuppressive drugs and then uh, a low-fat diet and the goal is to reduce the amount of fat that 
is in circulation literally so that it's not continuing to be dumped back into the GI tract. So if we know this is a uh, quasi-autoimmune disease and we know that it often is associated with inflammatory bowel disease, then maybe this is part of uh, a, a variation on leaky gut syndrome and some of the symptoms that can be caused. So remember we talked last week actually about leaky gut syndrome and the fact that you may see GI diseases, vomiting, diarrhea, all those good things um, that nobody loves to hear in the middle of the night and invariably we all have. Um, so, and actually somebody told me they were going to invent an alarm clock tone that was a dog retching because there's nothing that gets you up faster than hearing that sound at 3 o'clock in the morning. But anyway, I'm digressing. Uh, so at any rate, so if it's associated with inflammatory bowel disease and we have leaky gut syndrome because the bowel is inflamed and unhappy, then the symptoms aren't actually showing up. They're sort of showing up in the gut, but in truth what they are showing up as is inflammation and destruction of the lymphatic system within the bowel. And maybe elsewhere, but it's just that they're dumping fluid in there and so that's where the symptoms happen. Um, because it's a high fat fluid and highly cellular fluid, it causes diarrhea because uh, osmotic pressure. So if you've got you know, that whole idea about diffusion. If you've got plain water on this side of a membrane and then salt water on this side of a membrane, the little sodium ions go over here if they can get across a membrane to make the two sides isotonic or equal tonicity. Same thing with too much stuff in the gut, whether that's fat cells, um, electro, uh, boy, the words are not working today. Um, sodium, potassium, magnesium, electrolytes, things of that nature. Water is going to come out of the body and into the gut in an attempt to dilute it out uh, to kind of make things of an equal tonicity. So boom, horrible diarrhea, miserable symptoms. These poor dogs are losing weight. Um, they feel icky all the time. I can commiserate. Uh, so this is where if we back up a few steps, and we don't have one of those obvious causes like cancer, heart disease, um, portal hypertension, and inflammatory bowel disease that has not been addressed, or in infections in the intestines, whether that be something like C. diff, salmonella, intestinal parasites, things of that nature, um, then, all right, so now what are we going to do? Okay, we took care of all those things. Now we're going to give your dog prednisone and a low-fat diet for the rest of its life and hopefully that it doesn't get worse. And I will say this, in the last three to five years, I've seen three dogs that had probably what was lymphangiectasia that was horrifying because I couldn't control it. The internist couldn't control it with all the anti-inflammatory autoimmune suppressing drugs in the universe. And it was just dreadful to watch these dogs. Um, so what's our approach going to be here? Well, one, one thing I can tell you that does work well in, in cats and probably would work well for this dog is rutin, which is a bioflavonoid somewhat similar to quercetin. You can get it over the counter. Um, for cats with active thoracic duct tears where they're leaking this lovely chylus fluid into their chests, uh, somewhere between 250 and 500 milligrams per day is, has been an effective dose. Start low. If it's not quite getting it, work your way up. And so that's for cats and small dogs. And then, you know, still, I would just start with, even in a large dog for a disease like this, I would start with about 500 milligrams and sort of see what that does and then go to, to maybe three time a day dosing. So that may help control symptoms right away. Um, thankfully, my friend's dog is responding well to the prednisone. She's much more comfortable and feeling better. But the goal ultimately is to back her down off the steroids. And, and certainly the veterinarian she's working with, that's his goal as well, which is awesome. And he is very interested to see what else we could do with diet. And so this is where we're going to adjust the fat content in the crock pet diet because um, it will reduce the symptomatology of the disease and um, 
and help recovery. And eventually, we hope to be able to take it back up to a normal threshold. So the therapeutic diet uh, fat content should be somewhere around 20% in this situation. And then the crock pet uh, fat percentage is around 32%. So we don't have too, too far to go. So again, use leaner proteins. And then we're adding coconut oil to the crock pet diet to add a healthy ha uh, fat source in. And so what we may do in the short term is just 86 the coconut oil altogether and uh, you know get things stable get the pred dose as low as possible and then gradually reintroduce it the other thing I would would really work for on this dog is to to do a rotation and elimination diet again not fun not a pain it's some, somewhat of a pain but because these guys don't get so bored with the food it's much easier to carry off than it is for us and so that idea is to take figure out everything the dog has been eating for the last six months the food um, you know both what goes into the bowl table scraps they get regularly um, if you're doing a mix of cooked food and dry food what what the proteins and carbohydrates have been there as well as the vegetables and then also s treats any treats that they're getting and that's where we often fall down and then the other thing that's key is that we you know dogs are and cats too are not often hepped up on taking tablets or medication and so we'll use things to get stuff into them and so those are other things that you have to be cognizant of um, you know, cheeses, uh, Limburger, lunch meat, all of that stuff. Those you have to write down on your list of what to eliminate. And then from that list of what they've been eating for six months, then I would typically develop a three sets of food with one protein, one carbohydrate, and one or two vegetables. And uh, each day they're going to eat from set A, and then the next day eat from set B, and then the third day eat from set C, and then the fourth day start back over at set A. So that sounds really complex. Again, the gut health program lays this out in detail. And so I think that that has made it much easier to comprehend and work through for people. So that's gonna be critical because we have to heal the gut, right? We've gotta get things calm back down, seal up those tight junctions and get the gut to heal. In that same program, I discuss multiple different types of supplements to help heal the gut and repair it. And so glutamine is you know, an awesome example of what's helpful. Uh, and there's several others. There's a supplement we uh, sell on the website called GI Support that has been very helpful uh, as, and kind of packages all of those uh, gut repairing things in, in one spot. So that's another good one probiotics are going to be critical because guess what if you've got leaky gut you've got dysbiosis we've got bad guys in there that are kind of tearing things up and producing it to toxins and wreaking all sorts of having havoc so we've got to get the good guys in there to start winning the battle fish oil is going to be another one as long as the dog has not been eating a heavily fish based diet this is a great option I would not use flaxseed oil because uh, we can, we humans only absorb roughly 10% of it and dogs probably less than that. And so in an animal or a person that's already got horrible GI disease with evil awful diarrhea, flaxseed oil is not going to help. So, um, and Rosemary's popping in uh, to say she's going into her doctor's office. This is my friend with, with her, her pup that's having this issue. Um, so that's, you know, that's what you got to do. Heal the gut and, um, you know, just make sure that we get it healed well enough. And once we've got it healed, then keep this dog on a diet that is going to prevent it from having an outbreak. So unfortunately, again, this is a quasi autoimmune disease. Uh, Rosemary's dog is relatively young, and so there's a chance we may be able to get her into remission and potentially have a cure. The older you are when you get an autoimmune disease or quasi autoimmune disease, the more difficult it becomes. And so um, case in point, right? I think I told you guys 
all of my all of my woes this winter with the GI disease, but I had it 10 years ago and I've had C. diff three times. This predisposes me to getting GI disease in the future. And so if I'm a ding-dong and start eating the standard American diet, I will relapse. And if I overwork and overstress, I will relapse. So my goal is to not be a ding-dong and not do these things that are gonna put me in a position to have all of this horrible stuff I just experienced all winter long. Same thing with dogs. We get them better, oh, they're doing so great, we'll try a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and all of a sudden we've got symptoms again and we're back getting closer to square one, which is horrifying. So in general, here's what I'd say, life is fun, you know, we're meant to enjoy it. If you've got something like this going on, if you can adhere to what you need to do, you personally or your dog needs to stay well, 95% of the time, have fun. You know, normally I'd say 90% of the time, but in this situation, because we've got a quasi-autoimmune disease, you, your margin for error becomes slimmer. And again, the older you get, um, your margin for error becomes even slimmer. So as a nutritionist explained to me a lot of years ago, and this I think makes a great deal of sense visually, you know, you start out with light in life with this big funnel. You know, you, you, you're 18, you're 20, you can eat pizza six nights a week, drink tons of beer, do all those things that, you know, right now it's like, no way, man, that would put me under the, under the table, literally. Um, but as you age, your funnel gets narrower and your margin for error gets narrower until you're down to this very thin peak at the bottom. So think about autoimmune disease as advancing your cellular age or biological age even further than your uh, number age or chronological age. So we've got to account for that narrowing margin of error and just once we find something that works, stick with it. So does that mean that you're forever going to have to do uh, every day a different set of foods? No, it doesn't, but it does mean you need to be very careful about making sure to rotate each batch of food. Again, with a crock pet diet, because you're cooking in batches, that rotating food uh, every, every day is not such a big ordeal because you can make a big batch, freeze it in individual daily uh, portions, and then break out what you need to, uh, to take care of things. So um, I hope that makes sense. Again, you know, if you've got a better idea about how to name that gut health program so it comes across as essentially an autoimmune um, chronic GI slash leaky gut repair program, let me know. I'm all, all ears for that because I just, um, it's, it's what gets it across, but it's difficult to explain that that's actually the rudiment of health in this situation. So that's kind of the nuts and bolts in general about how I would approach something, a, a dog or a cat that's got these issues. And indeed, these, this has been successful for so many of my patients in the past. So that's what I've got for you today about lymphangiectasia. Have you guys got questions that I haven't answered about other, other situations? And while you're thinking on that, I'll mention as well that for whatever reason, out in the wilds of Montana, there is an outbreak of some sort of a disease that's causing a cough. And the fascinating thing is, is that it's in Montana in an area where dogs are not typically, um, you know, packed up on each other. There's not a big social, you know, dog park thing. There's not dog shows there. Um, there are some boarding kennels, but, you know, by and large, these are dogs that live outside, run outside with their owners, things of that nature. The thing that's fascinating is that out of, there are a lot of dogs getting sick, and out of many, many, like 30 or 40 dogs tested, two have tested positive for canine influenza, but they've also tested positive for a myriad of other things, like um, Bordetella bronchoseptica, which is the organism that causes kennel cough, Bordetella um, uh, pertussins, which is the human whooping cough, various bacterial organisms. So they really don't know what's causing this, which is fascinating, um, but it is making a lot of dogs sick. It's a good possibility that there is flu underneath all of this, but 
because the flu changes all the time, um, they simply may not be able to test for whatever variant this is. So remember several years ago, H1N1 was the flu strain that was just uh, associated with the avian flu and just really knocking people and killing many people. Um, so the issue is is that the vaccines that were developed for the flu didn't touch that strain and they didn't cross react well enough in people to help protect them from the flu. So that'll be interesting to follow and see kind of what ends up happening out there. Thankfully, none of the dogs have died. They have gotten awfully sick though and have required um, hospitalization, supportive therapy with fluids, and then intravenous antibiotics in many cases. So that's, that's something to kind of keep, keep an eye on. So if you guys have other questions, let me know. Um, not seeing any pop up here, so I'm gonna call it a day. And uh, next week I'll be coming to you live from the, uh, from the West Coast. Remember, your pet's best health starts in the bowl. Thanks very much, and we'll see you next week. Mm-hmm.